So there are a couple struggles with veganism video from the last few weeks. This one, Earthling Ed, and there's another one from Jenny Mustard. I might check out that one too. I haven't watched either of them, but I assume the Earthling Ed one is going to be more emotional, like struggling with just the sheer fact of how many animals are killed every single day. Globally, we're eating more animals than ever. And I suppose it's kind of funny, really, because when people aren't vegan, or maybe when they're, they're hearing about a vegan or their son or daughter or friend has gone vegan, they have this idea that the difficulties around veganism will center around things like getting enough vitamin B12 or, or getting enough protein or finding vegan food in a supermarket or a restaurant. And that's really not the case. That's not the hardship that we that we find most overwhelming. Far, far from it. Of course, it's easy to get the nutrition we need and there's so many great products everywhere now and it's easy to find fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes everywhere you go. I think he's right about that. People will bring up food deserts, but the vast majority of people who are trying to go vegan and like watching these videos and getting inspired have access to grocery stores that have fruits and vegetables. They have access to transportation, right? They probably own a car. Having access to those foods and even supplements B12 and, and whatnot are not an issue for the vast majority of people who are hearing about veganism and wanting to try it. Okay, so he tells the story about watching this video of this uh, person talking about uh, their son coming back from college, from university, and being like a totally different person, even looking different, presumably because he became a vegetarian. Obviously to this father, his son just going vegetarian is this uh, this huge ordeal and this, this big thing that he's actually kind of concerned about. And so going from kind of that relationship, I suppose, it's got me thinking a little bit about the relationship with, with my parents and probably what they thought a vegan was, you know, nine years ago or so when I, when I first told them that I'd gone vegan. And I think back then the idea of a vegan was someone who, you know, struggled to find food and, and actually probably uh, struggled to find good kind of toiletries, healthcare products and deodorant. I don't know. I don't think people would think about deodorant and stuff because they don't even know that that's not vegan. <laughs> I mean, like, if you really don't know anything about veganism, why would you think that vegans have to worry about mascara? And actually, just on the point of vegan deodorant, before we dive into the more complex conversation here around... I don't know, is this an ad? I'm very happy to say that Wild have partnered up with me for this video. Now, the reason that I love Wild is because Wild products are vegan, cruelty-free, and they also use compostable bamboo refills. Oh, they contacted me! Yeah, okay, I looked into that because I was like, that sounds kind of interesting. To be honest, the price was like ridiculous for what it is. And I don't know about you, but I don't go through a lot of deodorant. It just doesn't make sense to me to spend so much money on something with a compostable container when I go through a full thing of deodorant. A Dove deodorant probably lasts me almost six months and costs like a few dollars. I get the two pack thing when it's on sale. I know Native does, I'm not sure about Wild, but they might also promote the like aluminum is bad shit and I just don't want to support any companies that promote bullshit clean beauty stuff, you know? It's got his name on it. Do they do that for everyone? <laughs> That's the goofiest shit I've ever seen. Wild deodorant actually works. The scents smell great and it lasts all day too. Maybe for him, he looks like a beautiful, not sweaty boy. I am a disgusting, sweaty hog. So like nothing works except for clinical strength shit, like certain dry. That is the only thing that helps me sweat less as far as smell. What's the David tell joke, right? You shit in the bathroom and then you use the air freshener. Great. Now it smells like lemon and ass. Like it doesn't get rid of the smell, you know? So you're just, now you just have sweat and fucking blue. I don't think there's any blueberry deodorant. <laughs> Cucumber melon. But in terms of reducing the moisture, Certain Dry does that for me. The problem is it is so itchy. It makes me so itchy. I hate it. So I just don't use it. And I just get sweaty. Even right now, I'm just sitting here in like a comfortable room. It's 60 something degrees in here. Like it's borderline cold in here. I'm in a basement and I don't think I have a spot. I don't, why would I show that? I don't, I don't think I have any spot, but I can feel like wet. And here there's wet. I always get, 
I always get sweat right there above my lip. Point is, all these natural deodorants are basically the same when you look at the ingredients. And for someone like me, they just do not work. They don't work any differently than the Dove, except they smell like absolute trash. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't smelled wild. Maybe they actually smell good, but I am skeptical. Wild uses safe ingredients that are gentle on our skin. Safe ingredients implying that the ingredients in dove or secret or something are unsafe. No, no. Anyway, whatever. I know it's hard to make money on ads alone and Patreon. I assume he has a Patreon. I don't know. Um, yeah, I get it. Whether I'm in the UK, the US, Italy, wherever it might be, when I speak to vegans, it's the same kind of concerns or challenges or questions that are presented to me. And it's never, how do I get enough B12? It's, it's never that question. It's never, how do I get enough plant protein? It, it's never that question. The question, and I suppose the challenges that are communicated to me the most at these events are ones around friends, family, relationships. How do we navigate the complexity of being vegan in a non-vegan world? Now, I suppose he's talking to people who are very vegan or been vegan a long time. But when we look at people who were vegan, right, when we look at ex-vegans, they do talk about things like nutrition. They were worried that they weren't getting enough. Maybe they weren't having any problems, but they were worried they weren't meeting their uh, nutritional needs. Also, people just miss food, right? They miss eating meat. Maybe they miss the freedom of just being able to eat whatever. And honestly, I think it's why with a lot of these um, like YouTuber ex-vegan cases, they all sounds so similar and these like vague, maybe kind of health problems. I suspect that a lot of it comes down to just being sick of veganism and not wanting to be vegan anymore and just wanting that freedom of being able to just eat food and not having to look at a label. Because at the end of the day, people don't care that you're vegan. There is no societal pressure for you to be vegan. If anything, there's societal pressure for you to stop being vegan, to just be normal, which I guess would lead into what he's going to talk about, which is this, you know, relationship with other people. We have made a, de a decision to try and reduce violence and exploitation through our lifestyle choices. And this decision isn't because of a personal thing. This isn't because you know, for us as individuals, we think it would be good if animals weren't being harmed. No, no, the decision we made isn't based on like a personal preference. It's based on ethics and morals and, and values. It, it's not about us. It's about the lives of others, trillions of others. And so when we are around people who are not living in the way that we are, it's not that we're upset that people aren't doing what we're doing. It, it's not that we're upset that people aren't respecting us necessarily, it's the wider consequence of what their actions are perpetuating. That's what's hard, that's what's challenging, that's what's upsetting. Of course it hurts us and it hurts our emotions and it hurts our feelings or it affects our emotions and feelings. But the reason that we're upset about having non-vegan friends and family is because these are our loved ones. So my mother-in-law is vegetarian. And my oldest child found that out about a year or so ago, was obviously like disappointed. And so it was, you know, a good opportunity to talk about the gray area with kids, you know, as, as best you can. I don't know if it really makes much of a difference. For kids, they're good guys and they're bad guys, right? But it was a good opportunity to just talk about why, why there are so few vegans and Many people don't believe it's wrong to eat cheese and eggs, right? There are lots of people, lots more people who don't eat meat who think it's fine to eat cheese and eggs, you know, and we, we talked about that. But it did it did break my heart a bit to, to see them, like, visibly, oh. And it's not just friends and family. I was picking up my kid one day from school, and their teacher, who is very understanding of their veganism, always makes sure that they have like a vegan treat if it's like some sort of treat day or whatever, like she's fantastic. But I heard her talking with another parent or someone just talking about, you know, buying meat and this good deal she got on something, some kind of beef or something, right? And it wasn't, it was just, I was just walking to get my kid and it was just one of those moments, you know, you just go, ah, fuck, man. I've been watching Lonely Island stuff because I finally watched that pop star movie and it was, was kind of funny. It was, de it was decent. There were some good parts. And so I've been on this Lonely Island kick of just going back and watching all the, the Lonely Island stuff. And I watched the Threw It on the Ground. And there's part where there's just like a whole chicken, like a cooked chicken 
uh, thrown on the ground, you know, and I'm just having fun living my life, watching this goofy, dumb video. And then there's that. And like Ed said, it's not a personal thing. It's not like being reminded that I'm different. It's the being reminded just how few people see that for how wrong it is, you know, that there's, it's not even thought about. What else can we throw? Oh yeah, chicken, that'd be funny. The people around us aren't necessarily bad just because they engage within these industries, because it's not necessarily their fault. So then as vegans, we have to go, right, how do I navigate this, this challenge? How do I reconcile the fact that the people I love the most are doing the thing that I'm opposing every day through my choices, through my advocacy, through the conversations I'm having, through the work that I'm doing, through my everyday interactions? How do we go home and celebrate Christmas or birthdays or anniversaries or weddings? How do we, how do we think about these celebrations and think about them positively when we're at them watching people eat and gorge on the flesh and secretions of tortured, mutilated, exploited animals and sentient beings. It's a really personal thing, you know? I think the longer I've been vegan, the less I tolerate. <laughs> and part of that is because of who I'm married to. He's definitely a level five vegan. <laughs> like, he doesn't eat food from non-vegan restaurants, like, period. That's not true. There is a vegetarian Thai place that it's really delicious here in Portland. You can get egg on your stuff. And he's like, I swear it's cooked in the same wok. I swear to God, I taste the egg. So that was, that was a one-time thing for him. He would not go to a family function where meat is being served. Like he will not eat around people while they're eating meat. No, he's been vegetarian since he was six years old, I think. And it's just, it's just not something he can tolerate. It's extremely upsetting to him. I think I told this story before, but years ago, I told him about this place I would eat in Memphis called Huey's and they were known for having a really good vegan burger, a really good veggie burger. And I was like, yeah, I think it, why it's so good is because they cook it on the same grill as the beef because it has this, it has this certain like taste that you just don't get from veggie burgers. So I think that's why it's so tasty. And he was like, what you think? So you eat that? Like you think that tastes good and you know that it's probably because of some like animal that was like left on the grill. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, meat is like kind of tasty. And he was like mortified. It was funny to me, but also like, wow, you are you're very sensitive. Fast forward five, six, seven years, however long it's been. And yeah, the thought of eating a veggie burger cooked in beef fat, it's, yeah, no, I don't want to taste that. And also it's like, that's slightly upsetting to me. That's, that's where I'm at. Put it this way, I've never tried the Impossible Whopper. Now, one of the questions that was, that was asked to me, during one of the book signings, it was in Bologna. This, this very sweet lady came up to me and um, she said to me, when you see videos of animals, do you cry? And it really upset me that she asked that question. I, I said, yes, you know, sometimes I do. But what upset me about that was that it felt like she was asking for validation in a way. She was looking for me to, to kind of tell her that crying and being upset was okay. Crying and being upset and being distraught by what we do to animals should be the most normal response there is. It should be just the most obvious response there is. We see what's happening to animals and we get upset about it. Now that upset might manifest into crying or frustration or anger, or maybe just moments of solitude, and silence and, and, and quiet that we take, you know, as an individual on our own just to, to think through these issues and deal with them internally. Whatever way we process these emotions, these emotions are the most valid emotions that we should feel, should experience when we consider what we do to animals and we see what we do to animals. Yes, but we do need to, I think, have a little bit thicker skin just for our own protection. And, you know, empathy can certain, certainly be a burden. I think, is it Paul Bloom's book on empathy? I do this for a living, so I'm, I'm constantly being barraged with animal abuse. I'm not going and watching undercover footage all the time, but I am searching for things. I'm getting Google alerts. I'm seeing awful headlines about some new farm that was exposed for being a fucking farm, you know. If I cried every single time I came across something like that, I mean, I would just, I would, I would be a mess. It doesn't mean I don't care, but I have to put up some amount of barrier between myself and what's happening. Because if I, if I really stop and think and let that consume me, that's, that's what it does. I mean, it is, 
it's all consuming. Again, that's what I thought this video was going to be about, just the sheer number of animals living in terrible conditions right now. And it doesn't matter how many videos I make. It doesn't matter how much of my time I dedicate to this. It makes no difference for those animals right now. In these moments where we feel alone, where we feel isolated, where we feel like we are just an individual, it's so important to recognize that that's not the case. Change, especially societal change, feels slow. But when we look back, we can see that a huge amount of distance has been travailed. We have actually walked a long way. Think about what things were like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Things are far better now. Things aren't perfect. We face challenges, we face hardships, we face difficulties, but things are better now. And remember that 5, 10, 15, 20 years is a short amount of time, relatively speaking. Very well said. And I really love, I've talked about him every year now, I think, when I do vegan news. Um, I always reference Lewis Ballard and the work he does with open philanthropy. I highly recommend subscribing to his newsletter. And every year he puts out like a big wins, the big wins of the year for animals. And it's work that is helping animals right now, you know, to make their conditions a little bit better. I know not all vegans approve of that, but that's something that personally lifts my spirits. And so even in those moments where you feel isolated, alone, where you feel the, the weight of this issue is, is a weight that we are solely responsible for, it's important to recognize that that's not the case. And we are supported by millions of people who are also making these changes around us. And we should feel proud of ourselves and pride in our accomplishments and proud of our courage in those moments that are difficult. I remember someone said, left a comment, I think. I don't think it was a video response. I think it was a comment saying that I said in a video that vegans like should feel morally superior. So something like that. I was like, that's definitely not something I've ever said. But I think they heard me say something similar to what Ed's saying that, you know, vegans are we're, we're making the hard choices, right? And it's not just a personal thing that like immediately benefits us, right? We're doing it for others. We're doing it for animals. We're doing something we don't have to do that other people don't care about and even look down on. And we should be proud of ourselves. Like that's, that's an awesome trait to have, right? To be able to do the right thing, even if it's uncomfortable. This shift isn't going to happen overnight. It's going to be many, many years, especially before we see, you know, the complete eradication of everything that we would like to see eradicated. And look, let's be honest, it, it probably is not going to happen in the way that we want within our lifetimes. I think there will be huge changes in terms of the elimination of animal farming, of animal testing, of things like circuses and, and aquariums and such. We will see huge positive strides within our lifetimes for these issues. But I don't think we will eliminate the entire problem within our lifetimes. And what that means is that we have to remain positive. We have to remain determined probably for the rest of our lives. What we don't want to do is become so pessimistic and hopeless that we find ourselves becoming apathetic or filled with despair. We have to find that balance. Easier said than done, right? But he's exactly right, right? We need to be positive, but we also need to recognize that the road is long. I mean, look what just happened in Florida, right? Like... The road is long, but also most people don't care, right? They don't care that lab grown meat isn't natural, right? They don't care really where their meat comes from as long as it's not too expensive and it tastes good. And maybe that's really cynical or depressing, but ultimately it means, as many have said before, once we have a vegan alternative or a lab grown alternative, a cruelty free meat alternative that is comparable in taste and texture and availability and price, people are going to choose that option, right? If you tell people, hey, this was made with animals and you had to kill them and they're in captivity and they live in these awful conditions, or you can buy this and it didn't involve any of that, yeah, most people are going to choose the option that didn't involve animal suffering and destruction. We have a ways to go until we get to that point. But I think once we're there, things are going to happen quickly. Some days it feels like everything is going great. And some days it feels quite the opposite, doesn't it? But balance is important. And I think a sense of optimism for the future, which we should all have because there are plenty of reasons to be optimistic for the future. I think the hardest part for me is not knowing for sure what's going to happen and, and how it's going to happen. I know we're not going to continue with factory farming because we cannot for so many reasons, whether you care about animals or not, we cannot continue feeding ourselves that way. 
So I know that's going to end at some point, but there are so many things I don't know and there are so many things I'll never know because I'll be dead. And so that to me is really the hardest part, which sounds pre pretty egotistical, I guess it is. <laughs> and as I've said before, that the friend and family stuff, I've really lucked out. You know, a lot of my family is vegetarian. Some of my family is vegan. My immediate family, people I live with, my husband and my children, we're all vegan. My family has always been really supportive. That's just the type of family I have. I'm very lucky. So I've never had to deal with being made fun of. I mean, even when I was raw, <laughs> even when I was crazy fucking raw vegan, my aunt made me like a peach and blueberry salad thing for Thanksgiving dinner. Like she had to make all this food for everyone else. It's a whole thing every year for her. And she went out of her way to prepare me something that I could, could eat and made sure that it was something that I would eat. I mean, like that... I, that's what I'm used to. Maybe that's part of the reason why I'm not very tolerant of people, you know, making fun of or not being accommodating. Anyway, lovely video from Ed. I pretty much agree. I mean, what is there to disagree with, right? Everyone knows that the, the social issues are big for people. That's why a lot of people don't go vegan. They don't want to be a burden. They don't want to make it awkward. They don't want to be the vegan of the group. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. Leave your comments and questions down below. And of course, like and subscribe. And thank you so much to all of my members and my patrons at patreon.com slash unnaturalvegan. They help to support the channel. And I do post two exclusive videos a month for patrons and members for tier two patrons and members. I do a vlog, which I'm about to record now for May for this month. And then the second one is a controversial video. Someone joined last month and then watched the controversial video and said, how do I get a refund? That one was pretty controversial, I guess. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, guys. Bye. Have y'all seen this channel, We Cook Vegan? They seem to get like enormous views. This video four days ago, 446,000 views. And they're all like, my grandmother taught me the best way to cook sweet potato or whatever. I swear they have three different videos. That's like my grandmother, my mother-in-law. And then you watch the video and it's like boiled sweet potato and like a pea salad or something. <laughs> and it's just, what? How does this have this many views? And then you look at the comments and it's got like maybe a couple hundred or even less comments on like, again, half a million to a million views. So yeah, I, you know, I can't know for sure, obviously, but I, I think, um, I think they're buying views, which is just very stupid. Like that's not going to give you obviously the engagement that YouTube wants to see, right? I mean, it's against YouTube's terms of service to be clear. You are not supposed to do that, but also it's not going to get you where you want to go. And it's just disappointing. because it was like, we cook vegan. Wow. It's just this vegan recipe channel and it's getting like this many views. That's awesome. And then you click on it. It's like, oh, because <laughs> it's a scam allegedly.